worship together so if you would stand and sing with me sent his only son so that we may live through him. It is his love that brought heaven to earth, and it is the same love that redeems, reconciles, and transforms 
and makes all things new. We lit the first candle of Advent and found hope for our lives in the arrival of Jesus. Next, we lit the second candle of Advent as we discovered peace that comes from the presence of God in our hearts. We lit the third candle of Advent because of the great joy that we have in a God who came into our mess to heal and restore us. Today, we light the fourth candle of Advent as we behold our Savior's love for us. Would you join me in reading the prayer on the screen? God, thank you for loving us enough that you would sacrifice your life on a cross. We believe you defeated death, and we eagerly anticipate your return. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's all stand as we anticipate Christmas Day. Tell someone near you what time you'll be waking up this Christmas morning. everybody. So the next few songs we're going to sing are some Christmas songs I'm sure most of you have heard before. Um, even though we've heard them a lot, I will encourage you to truly worship God for what this season means to us. We love Christmas every year, but it's one of the best things that has ever happened to the world that Jesus came and died and came and was born and died on the cross for us and I think that we really need to truly remember that um, even though this happens every year.
In the incarnation, God demonstrated unconditional love. His love included the outsiders, the imperfect, and even the hard ones to love. Not love to those who have it all together, not love to those we know and feel comfortable around, but God also loved the world. I'm reminded that while we were yet sinners, messy and wounded and broken, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. As we speak to God in prayer, would you find a posture that helps you focus your heart and mind on Christ? Think about his love, his love and care for your soul, your life, your family. Give him thanks. Lord, we sing and are reminded that you went totally out of your way to include us. You refused to rest easy until you could come into our world and become one of us. And now you continue to stretch your hand to open your heart of love to include us as many as will come. Lord, as your servants, we want you to be available to you as part of your invitation to others. Change our inward focus. Forgive us. We've been takers, not givers. We've made exclusive guest lists when you distinctly said, everybody in. Give us your heart of love for others. Teach us to see others as you do through the eyes of concern and acceptance, just as you did sending Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Good morning. I am so glad that you have, uh, you have joined us around the mantle here. Uh, we've used this mantle uh, as a way to sort of trace the story of the family of Jesus. Uh, a few weeks ago, Pastor Christina shared a powerful message about the grace of God through the moms in Jesus' family. Uh, the next week, um, this, this furry, fuzzy, unkept stocking reminded us uh, of the message of Jesus' wild cousin John, repent for the kingdom of heaven is coming. Uh, last week, this plaid stocking reminded us that God expanded the dreams of the earthly father, Jesus, Joseph, and another Joseph in his family. This week, on the Sunday before Christmas, we are going to take a look at the son. The son in Jesus' family. Lots of families have sons, and they are all very special. But there's no son quite like this son. The son in Jesus' family was foretold by prophets centuries before. And since we're gathered here by the mantle, let's open the prophecy and let's read about him from Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Let's stand together and honor the reading of the word of God from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 10. It says again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try, to, to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before we sit down, I want to read one more couple of verses. Eight and nine say something very interesting. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head, or the capital of Ephraim, is Samaria. Thank you. You can be seated. I'm a pastor, I'm a husband, and I'm a father. But before all that happened, I was a son, and along the way I became a son-in-law. And what that means is that it won't happen this year, but most years, right after Christmas, I get in a car and I take a trip. I either go to Missouri uh, or Kansas or Oklahoma to spend some time with family. At times, that has been kind of a harrowing journey. Usually, we have to pass through St. Louis. It's about an hour from Erla's childhood home. When you get into this side of the town of St. Louis, it's like the interstate system becomes this mixed up bowl of spaghetti. Usually, we make a wrong turn. We wind up downtown on a one-way street. We always go through St. Louis on high alert. But when Earl and I first got married, we had to travel through Memphis to get to a family gathering in Oklahoma City. We'd never been there together before. And if you're headed east, or if you're headed from the east through Memphis to the west on I-40 and you want to stay on the interstate, you have to take a small one-lane exit and veer north. It's marked out by this tiny little sign. The first time we went through, I didn't see the sign. I didn't veer north. I stayed on the nice, wide road. It was, it was six lanes wide with a big median. It just felt like an interstate. And then after a little while, it was four lanes wide with a median. And then it was two lanes wide with a median. Then the median was gone. And then we were sitting at a stoplight in downtown Memphis, and a long train was passing by in front of us. Did I mention that it was midnight? And we were in the part of Memphis where people are still standing on street corners at midnight. What's more, the one time that my wife Erla had ever been to Memphis, she was a little girl and they'd stopped their station wagon to, to see some sight or to be involved in some attraction. And while they were doing that, someone smashed their windshield and stole her little girl purse out of the car. 
With our situation stopped by the side of the road, waiting for the train to go by in the red light district in downtown Memphis, and her having that memory, she paused and she said, um, can we lock the doors? I know. You're way ahead of me. The whole situation could have been avoided if I just paid attention to the sign. In the prophecy that we just read from the prophet Isaiah, God offered King Ahaz of Judah a sign. And man, did he need one. This king is terrified of two cities, not St. Louis and Memphis. He's afraid of Samaria and Damascus. I read a study that suggests that these two cities relate to more or less to two kinds of fears that we have. Samaria for Ahaz is like St. Louis for Earl and me. She grew up near there. She went there quite a bit. We passed through there often going to her home. Um, we're familiar with it, but we're still really careful and hot, on high alert so we don't wind up on a one-way street downtown. Samaria was the capital city of Ephraim. Ahaz would have known about Samaria because Ephraim and Judah, where Ahaz lived, were once part of the same nation. In fact, the people of Ephraim came from the same family that Ahaz came from. When Ahaz and his people feared Samaria, they feared the known. If you have way too much information about what someone very close to you might do next, you probably fear the known. Does the voice in your head ask things like, will her words bring the, the shame and the pain they usually bring when we get together? Is he going to go back to that addiction that hurts us all so badly? If you find yourself wanting to throw up your hands and roll your eyes and say, here we go again, you fear Samaria. You fear what you know. Ahaz feared Samaria, the known, but Ahaz also feared Damascus. Damascus never had been a part of the family of Israel. They were totally other. Damascus is that faceless assailant that we think will probably do us harm. Damascus is why we have soldiers on the ready and we put security systems in our homes and some conceal carry. We just don't know what kind of harm Damascus will do. Damascus is the fear of the unknown, but not necessarily the fear of what's far away. Sometimes Damascus is as close as your own body. The doctor reports a mass or a lump of some sort. The first scans are inconclusive. It may be cancer, it may be a cyst, it may just be a shadow on the scan. We won't really know and, until we do more scans. We have another one scheduled for five weeks. We'll talk to you then for five weeks. Damascus owns your thoughts. Damascus is the fear of the unknown. If Ahaz was only fearing Samaria, the known, or if he was only fearing Damascus, the unknown, he probably could have handled it. But, but just before this reading, Samaria and Damascus have come together in an alliance. They've teamed up to threaten Judah where Ahaz is king. When that happened, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 2 says this, the heart of Ahaz and of his people shook like the trees of the forest shake before the wind. About 50 weeks ago, I moved to an unknown city. I was excited but I knew some of the possible pitfalls of moving. I knew how hard it is to start relationships and learn a church and a town. I knew how awkward it often feels to, to be supposed to be the leader when really you just need to get to know a few people's names. I was excited, but I had some apprehensions about the things I knew could happen. What if it takes forever to sell a house? What if my personality just, just doesn't gel with the church? What if I just can't get the names in my head? What if... Well, what if half the staff takes career changes in the first six months? Ah, that'll never happen. Well, actually, it did. I was excited, 
but I was concerned about what I knew might happen, and it kept me praying. Then eight weeks in, what, we, what none of us ever could have known changed everything. Nobody ha- knew how to live when most of the businesses closed down and the church closed its doors for eight or nine weeks. I knew it was, it was a challenge to get to know a new church in a new town, but I had no idea how to do that when I wasn't going to see anyone but the office staff for who knows how long. As I lay awake at night praying, it dawned on me the apprehension of what I knew, Ephraim, and the fear of this new stuff we didn't know, Damascus. threatened to join forces against me. And I don't think I was the only one. Almost a year later, it's kind of interesting how the unknown has now become the known. Most of us know how to work from home now. We know how to do school and church online only or hybrid, sort of like we are right now. The unknown fear has become the known, but in the midst of this crazy year, we've also had to experience injustices that produced all kinds of racial and civil unrest, a a contentious election that feels like it might be giving us a dicey transfer of power. With a new leader coming in a few weeks, we don't know exactly what will happen in the future. It'd be pretty easy for what we know and what we don't know to band together, to unite together and make us live in absolute and total and constant fear if you're in danger of that listen to isaiah chapter 7 verse 9 it says this if you do not stand firm in your faith you will not stand at all after samaria and damascus unite ahaz has no viable way forward the prophet isaiah comes to him and he says ask for a sign And in his terror, Ahaz says, I will not put the Lord to the test. I will not ask for a sign. Just an aside, when religious people are too afraid to ask, you know what we normally do? We usually run to the rules. That's what we do. Yes, Scripture warns about testing God, but the Bible's full of stories of people who ask God for a sign, and God was willing to do something tangible Faith is the assurance of things not seen, but our God is gracious enough sometimes to open our eyes to the reality of what we need to believe Him for. Sometimes, God even gives us a sign when we don't ask for it. That may have happened to me recently. It's kind of a chilly morning, so I want to tell you a warm weather story. Monday is the day of rest for me. It's the day I don't go to church. I don't dial into the things that I'm called to do as the pastor. I'm just a person of God on Monday. It's the day of rest for me. Back in August of 2019, I began to, to realize that I could just sit at home when school was starting and, and everybody from my house was gone on Mondays. I could just sit at home and putter around the place, but I knew what would happen. What I know would lodge itself in my mind, and, and I would sit around and imagine all the things that I don't know, and that's just not very restful at all. I was in a conversation with another man who had Mondays off, and I learned that he hadn't played golf in seven years, and I hadn't played in 20. So we got to talking together, and we decided we'd play golf on Mondays, and so we went out and played golf. First Monday we went out and played golf, I played really, really badly. But um, no worries, we kept playing, and pretty soon I played worse. Yeah. I didn't know what was going on, so I went to an expert, and the expert told me, he said, with your build... And with that swing you've got, you got the totally wrong clubs. He said, but I'm not going to sell you any clubs because that wouldn't be kind. You need to go and you need to hawk deals and find some used or some cheap clubs and play with them a while because you're going to want to change clubs again when you get a real swing. That's exactly what he said to me. He said, I don't do that sort of thing, but maybe you can find somebody who does. So I I talked to a friend of mine who was a budding golf pro. Um, He was willing to help me, but it was August, and he was moving back to Florida so he could do the pro golf Um, season in the winter down there he said we'll have to do it by text message and by email because i'm going back next week and so he moved back we text message emailed back and forth he found me a club or two here and there used clubs 
Uh, down in Florida, they have expensive clubs that people just get rid of. So he was helping me, and he sent me a text message. He said, here's the link where you need to buy your irons. You're so weird, I can't find any used for you. They're going to have to make them. He said, now the good news is they're going to be really expense, inexpensive, not very expensive at all, he said, because they're good clubs, but they don't hire any celebrity golfers to sell their clubs, so that's how they keep them inexpensive. Um, and I said to myself, there is no chance I'll ever be a, cele a celebrity golfer. These are perfect for me. So I, I followed the link. I paid the money, and I bought them. The next day, less than 24 hours later, I got a phone call from the district superintendent of the South Central Ohio District of the Church of the Nazarene. Uh, he wanted to know if I would pray with my wife, Erla, about coming um, to meet the church board uh, at, at a church in Newark, Ohio, not New Jersey. So we prayed for a little while and felt like we, we needed to take that step. So we committed to doing that, and about that time I got an email that said my golf clubs were on back order for at least two weeks. So I just kept playing bad golf on Monday and praying really hard that God would, would show us exactly what the next steps would be. As the date began to approach, we began to pray more and more intensely about when we would come and actually meet in this room with the board. Um, one day before we were supposed to come and meet with the board of Newark Naz right here in this room, um, I got another email. Your golf clubs have shipped. I was like, I can't, I can't think about golf clubs right now. I'm praying about whether God wants us to move to Newark, Ohio, not New Jersey. And I thought to myself, but you know what? They're going to show up and they're going to be on my front doorstep for days if I don't figure out when they're going to be there because we never use the front door. And so I, I pushed the track package button and up came the FedEx website. And it said, package shipped to Parkersburg, West Virginia from Golf Works, Newark, Ohio. I sat there, look, I looked back at my phone, I went, what? And in that moment, it dawned on me that on the day, within 24 hours, that a district superintendent called to ask me to come and meet a board in Newark, Ohio. A man who was residing in Clearwater, Florida convinced me to buy a set of golf clubs that were manufactured here in Newark, Ohio. And I had no idea what was going on. Every time I tell that story, somebody goes, it's a sign. Truth is, I wasn't asking for that kind of sign. And the truth is, Ahaz wouldn't ask for a sign either. But God used the prophet Isaiah to give him one anyway. And the sign given to Ahaz wasn't some silly set of golf clubs. Isaiah said, a woman, turns out a virgin, would bear a son, and you will name him Emmanuel. Then Isaiah said he would eat curds and honey, and by the time he was able to refuse the evil and choose the good... In the short term, Isaiah was predicting that before this child is old enough to know right from wrong, about the age of two in that culture, the king of Assyria was going to come and level Samaria and Damascus. He was going to return those two cities back to their natural state where people would eat the things that grew wild like curds and honey. Assyria was going to take out the known fear, Ephraim, and the unknown fear, Damascus. On the surface, that was Isaiah's message. But on another level, when he talks about a child refusing evil and choosing the good and eating curds and wild honey, we remember Eden where God planted a garden and, and the man and the woman, they ate what grew naturally there and God planted a tree in the middle of the garden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were not to eat for it, of it. And when they did, immediately, the world became a scary place. They became ashamed and they hid. You know what shame is, don't you? It's fear of something about me and the fear that other people will know something about me. 
They experienced shame and they also hid from God because, frankly, they didn't know what God would do because of their disobedience. No one had ever disobeyed before. They were afraid of what they'd found out about themselves, what they knew, and they feared the unknown. Since then, we've all spent time like Adam and Eve and Ahaz, apprehensive about what we know about ourselves and afraid of what we know about the world and sometimes totally paralyzed by the combination of both. Even though Ahaz was too terrified to ask for a sign, even though our broken world was too paralyzed to reach out to God, God sent a sign, and the sign was a son, a baby to be born. When my kids were very little, I saw one of my favorite posters ever hanging on the wall outside of the little window where you're supposed to go get your baby at the nursery. It had a beautiful picture of an infant right there, and the sign said, a baby is God's way of showing that the world should go on. When Ahaz was unable to even ask for a sign, God sent a baby, a son. But not just any son. We don't know how much Isaiah knew of what he said. He may have thought that he was just saying that a young woman was going to have a son and would be named Emmanuel. It means God with us. Naming a son as a statement of hope was common in those days. But the words of the, ma- of the angel to Mary go way beyond that in the New Testament. Mary's son wouldn't just be named Emmanuel as a way to lean into hope. The son of the Virgin Mary would actually be Emmanuel. God with us. If you find yourself afraid of the known or afraid of the unknown or if you if you realize that what you know is teamed up with what you don't know and it threatens to paralyze you, Remember the story of the first family Christmas. An angel came to a young woman and said, You will be with child. And Mary said, How can that be? I'm a virgin. And the angel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Most High will overshadow you. And you will conceive. And the virgin for a son. His presence in the manger would be a sign to shepherds. His star in the east would be a sign to wise men. The word of that angel to the virgin is still true today. No matter what you know, no matter what you don't know, no matter how scared all that makes you, Luke chapter 1 verse 37 says, nothing will be impossible with God. Is your family going to live at peace through the overexposure of the holidays? You have a sign. And the sign is the Son. He is God with us. You may have the opposite problem. Empty chairs around your table because of grief or an empty house because of COVID. Will you be able to make it through the loneliness? You have a sign. The sign is the Son. He is God with us the winter season gives anxiety and depression home field advantage restricted activities long dark days and too much time for your mind to dwell on what you know and imagine the things that you don't know how you're going to endure that you have a sign the sign is the sun he is emmanuel god with us and with god nothing is impossible. We don't need to fear what we know. And we don't need to fear what we don't know. And we don't need to be paralyzed by the combination of both. We have a sign. And the sign is the sun, but not just any sun. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Verse 17 says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold Together, all things, even scary things, the known and the unknown. 
I told you about that scary night. Stopped at the tracks, just two 23-year-old country kids stuck in downtown in the red light district of Memphis, locking our doors. The train passed. We crossed the tracks, made our way to the family celebration in Oklahoma. A couple of years later, God began to speak to us. We took a phone call and went to the city of Memphis. We met with a church board two blocks from the intersection of that street and that railroad track. At that board meeting, we had the fear of the known, all those fears of getting to know new people and coming to a new town and will it work and all those things. We also had the fear of that night we remembered and Erla had the fear of the day she remembered when she was a little girl. Not only that, we sort of had the unknown of what it would be like to live in a culture where we were actually in the minority. We, we met with the board and we prayed hard. But we went ahead and went because we had a sign. The sign was the Son, the one who left the safety of heaven to come and be God with us. We knew that if God was promising to be with us in Memphis, we could go in confidence and stand in faith because nothing would be impossible with God. We had five good years there. Ministry was fruitful. We learned a whole lot about how to minister in a culture that we didn't know well and we hadn't grown up in. And God blessed our family with two beautiful babies right there in the place where we were tempted to fear after moving here and living here through 2020 with you or through most of it I can confidently say whenever things band together to make you afraid fear of what you know or fear of what you don't know you don't have to be paralyzed. We can stand together in faith. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, we've had tons of changes this year, but on January 10th, we'll be fully staffed again. Isn't that awesome? Whatever you know, whatever you don't know, we can stand together firm in our faith. Because we have a sign. And the sign is a son. He is God with us. And with God, nothing, nothing is impossible. Why don't you bow your heads with me as these talented folks come to, to lead us in another song. Father, we thank you that you chose to send your son to become a part of a human family. We thank you that fear does not need to paralyze us because we have a son. I pray that you would keep us focused on your son. Lord, if there's someone here who, who lives in fear, if that's you, I invite you just to bring that fear before the son of God. This baby, it's a sign. This baby, he's a sign that God wants you to go on. If it's the fear of something you know or the fear of something you don't know, I invite you to bring it to the, to the Son. If it's shame because of something you know about yourself, bring that to the Son and confess it. You can stand in faith. Because you have the Son. He's God with you and nothing is impossible. strong in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
tithes and offerings, there should be a text to give slide on the screen. You can text that number and give your tithes or offerings if you would like to, or if you brought it with you, there is a box in the back that you can put your tithes in. wonderful service this morning and um, as we just enter into this uh, Christmas time that we just celebrate um, what was given to us and um, though this is such a hard time we are we have so much to be thankful for so um, so thank you so much for this worship team can we give them a round of applause <laughs> it's so beautiful to have the violin and the ukulele and we have such talent that is willing to offer their Sundays to us um, on sometimes last minute basis so we are so thankful for them um, and also for Pastor Dan for bringing us the service. I just have a few announcements. First of all, welcome to Real Life. We are so excited to have you. Um, every week, it's just so good to see your faces. Um, if you are new to, uh, um, to our church, we have a connection card, um, and it is online that you can fill out. It's super easy. Go to NorkNaz.org, and um, you have a I Am Here tab, and just click that and fill out the information there, and you'll get emails that have to do with everything that's going on in our church, and it's so great. Um, such a good resource to have. Also, this Thursday evening is Christmas Eve, and although we are unable to have a live service this year, we are so excited to release a pre-recorded Christmas Eve home sweet home service online. This Christmas Eve beginning is beginning at 4 p.m. Families gather at your homes to cel celebrate together and watch at your own, um, your convenience. So this, I mean, this is great because we can do it in our PJs at home. <laughs> um, I will miss the service, but I'm so excited they have an alternative. Um, so just tune into your Facebook page or catch us online at www.norknaz um, for Christmas Eve. Also, we are giving away special Christmas Eve home sweet home boxes filled with candles um, for our carols at the end, communion, and a few special gifts. The boxes are available for pickup. Um, through the 23rd here in the, um, I believe we may have some in the back, um, yep, on the back table. So if you have not gotten those, please do so today. And then you don't have to make a separate trip, but they are available until the 23rd. And um, it's just an awesome way to worship with our families at, for Christmas Eve. And then lastly, our weekly youth group gathering called Ignite meets every Sunday evening at 6.30 at the firehouse. And we have a special Christmas party edition tonight. Hope to see everyone there. Um, as for all of our events and updates and serving opportunities are emailed and posted on our Facebook page and also on our Friday, um, Friday emails that we get. So please, lastly, enter your email address so you can get those. And um, so thank you so much for coming. And we have the benediction from Sarah. Let us go from this place proclaiming that we have seen the glory of God, believing that there is a light that shines in the darkness, which the darkness shall not overcome. And may the love of the Creator, the joy of the Spirit, and the peace of the Christ child be with you this Christmas and evermore. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Merry Christmas.